making the LFS system bootable. Right, so this is where we've got to configure an FS tab. So again, let's copy this in and edit it. And we've got several things to do here. We need to specify the root partition, the boot partition, as well as the swap file. We need to tell it what devices they are and what file systems are active on them. Um, what I've tended to do recently is to use um, the UUIDs, which I think, do they mention that here? Uh, no, they don't actually. Uh, which is not particularly necessary, especially in a situation like this where the hard disk is always going to be in the same, uh, always going to be the same in the system. It's just a single hard disk. But especially if you're using a removable device such as USB, it can be useful to specify UUIDs um, because it means that no matter what device the U the USB appears at, the UUID of the device will never chain where it change, whereas the actual device that Linux sees it as when it's plugged into the system could conceivably change from one machine to another. Or, for example, if you already had a USB device plugged in, storage device, uh, if you plugged another one in, then that device would change. So to do that, we specify the device with UID equals, oops, if I press insert first, UUID equals, and then we find out the UUID device and stick it in after that. And we can do that for all the partitions. So that's the root. Create one for the boot. It's actually going to be a lot longer. So that's X4. The root file system is EXT4. Uh, the only change I'll make for the boot, I won't use defaults, is no auto, which means it won't be automatically mounted at, at boot up. Uh, Probably have that dumped and the file system check order, probably two. So, all we need to do now is to find the UUID of those partitions. Uh, so, let's save that and we do ls block slash dev slash sda star. No, not ls block. I always get this wrong. It's block ID. Yeah, that's it. And we want the UUID of each partition. So the partitions, if you remember, the first one was the boot partition. The second was the swap partition, as you can see there. And the third was the root partition. So we'll start by copying the boot partition UUID. Go back and edit it that, edit that and put that in there. So this is the boot partition. Uh, that's the only problem these UUIDs are so long that it means there's not much room on the rest of the line for all the other parameters. So that's that one. The next one is the swap partition. So that's that line there. Paste that in. And finally, the root partition, which goes on that line there. So that's the UUID, that's the mount point, that's the file system there, and these are the default mount options. 
and that should be the end of that. And some more information about things uh, to do with the FS tab. So now we go on to building the Linux kernel. Um, important. So building the Linux kernel for the first time is one of the most challenging tasks in LFS. Getting it right depends on the specific hardware for the target system or specific needs. There are almost 12,000 configuration items that are available for the kernel, although only about a third of them are needed for most computers. The LFS editors recommend that users not familiar with this process follow the procedures below fairly closely. The objective is to get an initial system to a point where you can log in at the command line when you reboot later. And that is the, the important thing. Um, yes, you might not have network working or something else might not be working properly, but as long as you can get to the command prompt, uh, sorry, not the command prompt, the shell prompt, and you can type in commands and do stuff, you can just start to tweak the kernel if there's something still not working, like Wi-Fi or something like that. Um... So, yes, but normally what I do here is, well, let's start it extracting because it's quite a big package. Normally what I suggest here is after make proper to clean it is to do a make def config, which creates a default config for the architecture you're on uh, with some sensible options that are set. Uh, some, or a lot of options are set that are not needed to. For example, I think nearly all of the network interface cards are set, but you can go around and remove them afterwards once you know you've got got stuff working um, but like I said previously I've got a config for this machine already so I'll just be copying that it's a, it's from an earlier version of Linux um, so it'll just need to be updated um, but if you want to know more about configuring the kernel I have done a video about um, customizing the kernel it's a, about a year or so old but it should still be quite relevant to uh, the current kernel. So the first thing we need to do is to clean the output or the uh, source tree which is as it says here the kernel team recommends to do that. Uh, now they said that here you can use menu config to get to um, a menu system but I'd run the make def config first and then, then go into the menu configuration system. So I'm going to copy the config that I've got, which is actually outside of the root. So I need to get another tab up here. Yep, there it is. I need to move this or copy this rather into MNT LFS root. Uh, okay, I should, should be able to see that now. There it is, so I'll copy that from the truth root into this. Linux directory and I'll call it the default config file name which is .config. Now I can run a command called make old config which should just ask me for updates, things that have changed between the version that I use which you can see is kernel 6.1.11 and the current version. So I just need to Go through these. Check the answers. There shouldn't be too many of these. Most of these are device drivers by the looks of it. Okay, so now I can do make menu config. Uh, 
and we should get into the menuing system for setting the Linux kernel. So the one that I'm particularly worried about is the networking device driver. So I'm just going to check that first of all. As long as I've got network access, then it means I can actually access the internet. And yes, that looks like that's set. Right, come out too far. So, um, the one thing that you must do is go and s check all these options here because, as it sa says, that the system might not work correctly or boot at all if these options aren't set. So, I'll go through these now and just double check that they're all set. So, the first one is general setup, which is the first option. Then, we've got to check that the compiler kernel with warnings as errors is unchecked. So that's that option there, it is unchecked. Next one we've got to look for is under CPU task, time and stats accounting. And there it is there, so we go into that sub menu. And I need to enable pressure stored information tracking, which is that one there. You can do help to double check the config name. So you can see that one's called PSI, that's that bit there. All config options begin with config underscore. So the unique part of the name is the bit after that. So that is the right option. So I'll press space there to, to set that. And the next option, require boot parameter to enable pressure stored information tree should be left unset. So that's okay. So quit back and then we look for under general setup, enable kernel headers through the syskernel kheaders tar.xz. So that's that option there, and that's got me left unset. Then we need to look for control group support, which is that one there, which needs to be set. That's fine. We go into that one, and we need to set memory controller, which is that one there. Exit that, and then look for configure standard kernel features, expert users. And we want that unset, so that's okay as well. So we'll leave that menu, exit, back to the top. And the next sub menu we go into is processor type and features, which is that one. And we want to set build a relocatable kernel. So let's look for that. There it is, there, that's set. And we also want to set randomize the address of the kernel image. So that's the next option. So press space to set that option. Quit the, back to the top menu again. And the next one we need is general architecture dependent options. <clears throat> that's that option. And we want to set stack protector buffalo, buffer, the buffer overflow detection, which is already set and stongs strong stack protector which is also set as well so that's good next we want to go to device drivers so back up to the top down to device drivers and set or look for generic driver options that is that at the top was it I think oh yes there it is there and we want to go to frame buffer devices Uh, no, sorry, I'm up here, aren't I? Getting lost. Genetic driver options. Support for U event helper. I need to uncheck that and ensure maintain a dev tempfs file system mount at dev is set and auto mount dev tempfs is at dev as well. So they're okay. Now we go back and we look for graphics support, which is down here. That one, go into there. We want frame buffer devices. 
which is that one and support for frame buffer devices which is already set we'll quit that then we want to go to console display driver support and ensure that frame buffer console support is set well it's already been forced on by something else so that's okay lastly it says enable some additional features if you're building a 64-bit system if you're using menu config enable in the order of config pci msi first and this is so that certain options only appear in a certain order so config pci msi is that one there we need to enable that one first so go back to device drivers we want to look for pci support which is near the top go into that enable message signal interrupts which is already set then we need to go to config irq remap which is this one here so it's back up one then we scroll down to io mmu which is near the bottom somewhere there it is there that's set so we go to that and we need to set support for interrupt remapping so it's that one there set it by pressing y or spacebar then we can exit all the way back up to the top and then we need to go to process the type and features which is that one and then enable support x2 apic which is that one there's an option there if you're running a 32 bit system with more than four gig of ram and if you're running an mvm esd ssd so it's one of those hard disks on a circuit board rather than the ones that look like two and a half inch SATA disks. In fact, I think there are some SATA interfaced disks that are on circuit boards, come to think of it. So you'd have to check to see if you have got an NVMe device, but you do need to check it as it says there, if you have got an NVMe device. So um, there's an explanation for all those options. We need to save them now by exiting. So yes to save that and then we'll run make to compile the kernel. And I'll put in J4. I can't I can never remember if uh must do if make honors the make flags when you're compiling the kernel a lot. I presume it must do because it's using make, so I'll just take a punt on that and wait for that to finish compiling now.
Okay, so that's finished compiling. Um, because we've got modules turned on in the kernel, I need to run this to install the modules onto the system. Um, if you've just turned them on and off, sorry, and you've uh, created a monolithic kernel, um, running, you can run this. It will just say there's no modules to to install. Um, if you decided to use a separate boot partition, which we have done, as it says here, make sure it's mounted in the true environment. So if this doesn't work, it means the UID is wrong. And there you go, it has worked. So if we do df-h, you can see there's the boot partition. And it's empty apart from obviously lost and found. So the first thing we need to do is to copy the actual kernel image itself into that partition. Um, a symbol, symbols file for the kernel. And finally take a copy of the config as well. It's always good to have a, a reference um, of the config. We can install some documentation the kernel um, yeah there's something here that may be an issue with some people is that the files in the kernel uh, the Linux directory are, some of them might not be owned by root these are the looks of it um, so I recommend running this command on the Linux directory, just to ensure that all the files are owned by root. There's some information there about why the um, Linux directory shouldn't be in a certain place, and about the include files, um, and some information about module load order, if, if that's uh, a necessary thing for you. So that's the kernel set up. Uh, one thing I do recommend is to keep the kernel sources because um, the chances are you'll need to come back and modify something. And if it's just, for example, adding in another driver, uh, just by enabling that driver in the kernel will mean that just that part of the kernel will be built um, rather than having to rebuild the whole lot. If you delete it and then rebuild it every time, it will have to compile. And if, like me, it's taken 15 minutes or so, um, you'll be wasting a lot of time. Some options do touch all parts of the kernel, which is obvious if they're like a overarching option. Um, that's unfortunate, but let, let the kernel uh, make file decide what needs to be updated with, with any changes you make. Just uh, keep it around forever. Um, it's recommends boot uh, creating a rescue disk which I've never done you can do this if you wish to but um, you know we've got the live USB we've booted from which is a perfectly adequate disk uh, but it's good that they've produced the information there it's all part and parcel of the doing it from scratch kind of idea um, so the first thing we need to do is actually install grub into the boot sector of the hard disk if you you've got a slightly different setup you have to be careful that dev sda is the device you want to write to it might be dev sdb you know if, if the disk you've been creating linux from scratch on is slightly different or if you want to boot from a different device and so on you have to uh, consider uh, what you're doing very carefully with this with this command but this is the only disk in this system. There's no other operating systems around. So that's exactly what I want. So I'll just paste that in and wait a few seconds for it to execute. It's a little bit quicker on an electronic disk. It does do a lot of chunking around on the on the hard disk. So it'll take a, you know, maybe 20 seconds or so. Uh, if you've, you've installed UEFI or want to boot from UEFI, it does say there that there's a slightly different uh, command line you have to run. So that's good. It says installation finished, no error reported. So now we need to create a config file which tells Grub how to boot and what to boot. 
So if we create that like that, um, again, I started using uh, UUIDs here, and there's a big note about how to set this because it's not really straightforward or not really obvious immediately. Um, but this bit explains the options in there. Uh, and also from Grub's perspective, how it works. Although we've installed all the boot files into a boot subdirectory, it's in its own partition and that's all that Grub sees because we tell it it's on that partition and that partition by itself, the boot partition, everything's in the root of that partition, if you like. We only make it a sub subdirectory because it's in a subdirectory called boot. So you have to remember that uh, every reference, so for example, this is not needed because we've got it in a separate partition. Had we not had it as a separate partition and it was part of the boot, uh, the root partition, then that is absolutely necessary. But because we've got a separate boot part, yeah, boot partition, uh, we need to remove that. So let's do that first of all. So edit boot grub grub dot config. Let's remove that straight away. And then we'll read this information about using UUID de designators. Like I say, they're a bit of a pain to look at, a bit ugly, but uh, it's they're far more flexible if something in the system changes, if the allocations of the device, the hard disk device changes. Um, and I've got some machines where the boot di device for some reason is the last device maybe uh, searched for by the BIOS and uh, although you've booted from it, it actually allocates that device last and I think I've got one machine where it's got one SATA port and two IDE ports and if you're using the IDE ports fine no problem it's SDA as soon as you plug a SATA device in that SATA device becomes SDA, it always becomes the primary um, hard disk. And then the boot device that is on the IDE that used to be SDA now becomes SDB. And it won't boot then, even though you tell it you want to boot that device. So it, it can be quite annoying in that situation. Modern BIOSes, you tend to be able to rejiggle around what device you want to boot, especially the UEFI side of things. Um, so it's probably not as much of a problem as it is with uh, older machines. So uh, let's just read this here. It does mention like USB thumb drives where the designator can change. Uh, oh yes, it says to run this command here to find out uh, UUIDs, but you have to run that on the host system to get some meaningful information. Uh, and then what this does here, it shows the actual UUID of device and then a partition ID as well, which is what we're going to need also. So let's go back here. Uh, let's just make that a bit bigger again. Right. So it says we've got to replace the set root equals HD, X and Y. So the old method, you specify a physical device uh, indexed as zero. So the first device is zero, second is one and so on. Separated by a comma is the partition number within that device. So the first partition is number one, second is partition two and so on. So our boot device is the first partition on the first disk. So that would normally be zero comma one there. But the way we're going to do things, it says to replace that line. So all of that line gets removed. And we replace it with this search set root and then FS UUID. And then we've got to enter the UUID of the file system where the kernel is installed. So if we go back here. The UUID of the file system is this here because you can see that's where boot is and that's where we've just copied the kernel to. So that's what we want. So go back here and paste that UUID in. 
we next need to replace this part here where it says root equals dev SDA2. So as I said before, you know, on a particular system I can think on, I've, and I know I've got other systems where devices change if you add and remove hard disks. So it could be that with this machine, if it happened, I don't think it does. If I had another hard disk, that this drive that we're editing might change from SDA to SDB, and that would mean that if I try to boot from this drive, it wouldn't boot because, well, it'd start to boot, but it wouldn't be successful because uh, it's now SDB and it couldn't find what it wants to find on SDA because that's that's the new hard drive that's been installed. So we'll remove that, and we need to replace that with root equals the part UID equals, so it's a kind of a funny syntax this is, but then we need the UUID of the partition where the LFS was built. So if we go back here, we need the part UID, UUID, not the file, so this is the file system ID, this is the partition ID, so this is the container for the file system, and it's this partition ID that we need, but we need the boot, sorry, the root partition number. So that's the uh, boot partition, that's the swap partition, and this is the root partition, and that's the one we need, the root partition, because you can see that's the one that's mounted at MNT LFS. So we'll paste that one in there, and that should be all we need to get the system to boot using UUIDs. And it does explain there that UUID of the partition is completely different to the UUID of the file system partition. So that's all we need to do to change that. Now we go to the final page.